Welcome to our webinar today. I'm just going to give you guys a chance to jump on here. My name is Lori Frankham. I'm the Education Program Coordinator with the Central Kootenai Invasive Species Society, otherwise known as CECUS. Thank you all for joining us today for our Planting for Pollinator webinar. So before we begin, I am just going to go through a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we would um, ask that you do stay on mute and have your video off at this time. So those of you who are new to Zoom, if you go to the bottom uh, left-hand corner of your screen, there's a mute and uh, stop video button. So if you can just push those, that would be great. If you did have any questions um, through it, you can go into the chat box. So again, bottom of your screen, right middle, there's a little, a little bubble there. You can click on that, type in questions. If you're having any IT issues, I'll be managing that through the presentation. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so if you're a note taker, by all means, go ahead. But you can definitely also sit back, relax, um, enjoy, and you can revisit these slides at a later time. So those of you who are just joining us, if you could please put your please video put your off video. and yourself on mute, that would be great, bottom left-hand corner. We are going to be giving a lot of uh, information throughout the presentation. There will be an email sent out after the presentation that will give you all of these um, all these references as well as a webinar recording. We also have a very short survey that will be in that um, post webinar email that's going to go out. So if you could kindly fill that out and a thank you for your time to fill it out, your name will get entered um, into a draw to win an awesome Sea Kiss tote bag. Um, so those are all the housekeeping notes for now. So what we're going to do is we're going to get to know a little bit about our audience before we get into the uh, presentation. So I'm going to launch a poll here that has six questions. So you should see that pop up on your screen. So there's six questions there. You will have to use the scroll bar um, to access all the questions. So just click what best applies to you. So the first one is how long you've been gardening. The next one is, are you a beekeeper? The next one is, are you a her, uh, hobby um, gardener or farmer? Are you a commercial grower? Uh, what is your experience of growing bee-friendly pollinator gardens? And last, that if you are aware of the Plantwise Grow Me Instead program. So there's a few more people here that I'm gonna let in. So if you guys, well, let's leave this open for about a minute so we can get to know you a little bit. So those of you that are just joining us, I do ask that you turn off your video and mute yourself, bottom left-hand corner. And currently we have a poll up for everyone to answer. There's six questions. Please use the scroll bar to go down. It looks like half of you have participated, so we'll give you another moment. So if you can't see the poll, you may have to fiddle around a little bit with your um, screen size because it might be hidden behind another screen. And if you can't access the poll, that's okay too. We're just going to leave it open for about another 30 seconds here. Six questions. Getting to know you guys. Just some latecomers here, so I'll omit them in. So if you're just joining us, um, just a couple housekeeping notes. If you can turn yourself on mute and your video off, bottom left-hand corner, and take a moment to fill out these six questions. There's a scroll bar on the side there. We're gonna leave it open for about 20 more seconds. Looks like we have everyone but six people have filled it out, so let's give them a minute to have a look. Fill it out. So 10 more seconds. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll and we'll have a look at what the results are. So you can see who's in our audience. So how long you've been gardening? Uh, the most popular answer is between four to six years to seven to 10 years. So we've got lots of experience out there. Awesome, lots of beekeepers. 90% of you are beekeepers. 71% um, are either hobby farmer, hobby gardeners or farmers. We have only one commercial grower joining us today. 
experience with growing bee friendly gardens. So a lot of newbies out there. So this is great. We hope to share a lot of information with you. Um, and it looks like the majority of you, 76% are not aware of the plant-wise grow me instead program. Um, so we will get to that. So now that we've gotten to know about a little bit about you, we're going to, I'm going to let you know a little bit about CKIS. So if I can have the next slide, please. Kate, could you just turn it to the next slide? Okay, that's all right. So um, basically CKIS is a nonprofit organization that was formed in 2005 with a vision to protect our ecosystem and communities from harmful impacts of invasive species. So when it comes to invasive species management, prevention is the most effective tool in our toolbox. And one way we do accomplish this is through our PlantWise program that we're going to discuss in greater detail um, in the webinar. So at this time, I'd like to introduce you to our guest speaker. Kate is the founder of Elk Root Conservation Farm Society. She's an avid bee conservationist and designer of elk root pollination demonstration orchard and gardens. She's going to guide us through how to plan, prepare, select, design, and plant a gorgeous flower garden display that we're going to love and the bees are going to thank us for. So I'm going to put myself on mute and stop my video and I'm going to turn it over to Kate. You are there. Yeah, looks great. Perfect. Okay, let's go for it. Well, <laughs> Still, the gremlins are at bay now. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today, as Laurie said, we're going to be really touching on the surface of the topi topic of uh, creating bee gardens. Um, you will see a lot of information on these slides, but don't get overwhelmed or worried. You can go back through them. Um, it's really very much so you have a placeholder. So, if you want to contact us, here at Elk Root, or you want to speak um, with CKIS about some of the invasive species topics, you can go back, look through, and think about what would work for your garden space and you personally. So we've kind of created a shotgun approach to everything, and then you can pick out what you need. So I really would love you to just sit back, enjoy the presentation, enjoy the pictures, and just let your mind kind of open to this concept. And all of the technical pieces that I'll just touch on and identify, you can always come back to us for further information on that. So just a little quick uh, intro to Elk Root Conservation Farm. We're a new kid on the block in the registered not-for-profit um, realm in the Slocan Valley, BC in Balakin. And our mission at Elk Root is we're working on innovations in agricultural practices. Um, we're basically going beyond organic in the sense of creating regenerative practices, incorporating uh, pollinator wellness and bee wellness specifically, food security, and best beekeeping practices for people so that they can really um, go beyond some of the chemical and, and um, non-integrated approaches. The idea is then to take this and the things that we're doing here that are some of them are really super cool and we're excited about and to provide education for everyone through sharing the innovations and expertise um, and from all ages and stages. So little kids running around in little bee suits learning about bees to looking at the demonstration gardens all the way up to um, discussions with some of the uh, post-secondary institutions that we are doing some going to be doing some collaborations with. We'll also be having starting next Next year farm garden tours. Uh, we hope to do some workshops on some of these more technical items that I mentioned that I'm just going to sort of zoom over today. And also there's volunteers already out here um, and we'll be looking at internship opportunities for people that really want to learn because the best way with gardening is hands-on as I'm sure a lot of you know I said there was a lot of very experienced gardeners on the on the polls. And bottom line is all of this comes together because we want to be conserving and protecting the Columbia Basin while we are also integrating food security and making sure that we have this beautiful environment for years to come. So all of this goes hand in hand with the concept of regenerative farming and local food security. 
So just to give you an idea of why I'm speaking on this topic, some of our bee conservation projects we've been working on with uh, support from the government have to do with that expansion of pollinator gardens, whether it's on a farm, your backyard, rewilding or lawn alternatives. Also creating a, a native plant resource for us here in the Kootenays and in BC. And um, that's what these different pictures are identifying. So that you have a resource of local, really ecotype native plants that you can source rather than going far afield because those aren't necessarily exactly adapted even though they are native to BC but may not be adapted to our region. Then um, basically why are we here? Let's just get inspired by these ideas. Think about what you want, what your space looks like and let's kind of come together with something and there's all sorts of options you can do here as you can see from the slide. Um, what I'm showing in the pictures is an example of a cover crop for bees that is like feeding your bees that your bee apiary um, and then you know a really manicured type of picture and then a really sort of wild but cultivated uh, meadow so whether you're a teacher looking for ideas for your schoolyard or just a backyard gardener at home there's there's a little of something for everyone here so a little on bees just to get us our feet wet here native bees are really diverse and you can see from the top two pictures we have a bumblebee there and then we have an or blue orchard mason bee and they're just completely different but just amazing little creatures and they come out at different seasons and, and they're very very cool. Uh, honeybees as you can see from the bottom there tend to look very similar only some are very blonde and some are a little darker so this is sort of a in-between one that I picked for you to take a look at. Uh, wild bees tend to be ground nesters, cavity nesters and honeybees uh, collect in a hive. They have one queen and thousands of bees that are doing the activities to keep the hive going. Uh, the, most of them are solitary, the wild bees, and um, the females self-sufficient, whereas the honeybees are interconnected. And they are, as I mentioned, not native. And they literally treat the queen like a queen. They, she has attendants and is taken care of, fed, and her only job is to produce eggs. Uh, wild bees tend to stick closer to home. They like to have nesting close by. Uh, honeybees will fly depending as long as the temperature is high enough and they will fly quite far afield there. And how this applies to your garden, one thing is bees need water. So make sure to have some sort of water source in your garden. Perhaps it's just a little dish with some rocks in it, but make sure you have something there and then change that water on a regular basis uh, so that you're not attracting mosquitoes. There's a tons of wild bees worldwide species, uh, 450 in BC. We have huge variety of ecosystems in BC, hence that variety. And honeybees, there's only about 44. So it's, it's not as big a group worldwide. So in your garden, things to think about here. We've got ground nesting bees. You can see the top picture there. It tends to look a bit like an anthill. So don't just close it up. Uh, you want to make sure you're all set with that uh, and, you, and you leave some space for bees. They also like cavities there, you can see. Uh, bumblebees like uh, shrubs and brush and plants like Newt Carosas there, that other picture, are really great for bees to use for nest building materials like leaf cutters and mason bees. So all of those things, having them in their gar your garden, not using pesticides and creating those bare soil and sunny spots for bee nesting is really great. So, what do you want your dream garden to look like? Uh, I always say reflect yourself, enjoy it, make it beautiful according to what your terms are. Don't wor worry about what anyone else thinks, whether that's a really manicured version or a meandering garden where it kind of goes all over a little bit wild. I'm sure a few of you, uh, we have some wild ones out there. So enjoy it, do what works for you. There's meadows and then perhaps you want a bit of everything. So what do you think? We'd, we'd like to know, Lori. Okay, so I just launched a poll there for everyone to have a look at. So what garden appeals to you the most? We'll give you guys about 30 seconds to answer this um, and then we'll pull the results up. So yeah, 15 more seconds. People are answering away. Awesome. The more we know, the more I can focus on what I talk about within the slides. So it's really great for you all to participate in the polls. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll in five. Four, three, two, one. Okay, so <laughs> all of the above looks like. So the shotgun approach. Okay, well, we'll keep going with the shotgun approach. And as I said, you can always come out to us uh, later on and, and we'll get that sorted.
with the details. Okay. So Lori, um, is the poll down? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So are you seeing the poll on my screen? Lori? Nope, I'm not seeing the poll. Nope. Okay. Okay. So how to create a beautiful bee garden and where do you start? So selecting a site is really your first step. Okay. And from there, the rest of it will follow what you plan, put in, and how you prep it. Some of the in initial considerations you want to think about are consider the existing and native plants, okay, uh, or whether there's invasive species on site, because how you deal with them will be very different. So just do a little tally and check that out. Native plants, maybe think about either incorporating them into what you're doing, or maybe you even want to pick a slightly different spot if there's a lot of really valuable native bee plants. And then sun, soil, and water availability, super important, okay? Wildlife pressure, we'll talk about a little bit later on. Now, then we have assessing and observing your space as your second step. And you also want to assess your resources, your time, your expertise, and your financial resources, because as you can see in our little tip here, um, Newbies, it's a great thing to start small because you want to set up yourself for success. And when you look at this picture, you'll see we had a lot of space here. This took a, a number of years of prep and planning to put this garden in here at Elk Root. Okay. Um, and that's to the point of are you starting where you're just putting some bee plants in an existing garden or are you starting from scratch? Because then the prep is obviously very different as well. And then, you know, you want to figure out your site and again that whole idea of what you're dealing with and and your you know the the suitable site things that you're managing as far as plants and different specific uh, issues you might deal with as far as preparation. So one preparation technique you will see often with larger commercial farms particularly is tilling. So to till or not to till is a big question. Um, this is obviously for bigger things like meadows, but we generally don't encourage tilling because it tends to, to till up plants and, and encourage growth, especially with weeds, which are really by definition things that you don't want where they are. Um, if you have a specific plant for, plan for that, as you can see in this slide, that's different. And if you have a big space within bases or lots of things you don't want growing there, definitely talk to us first. Solarization and sheet mulching is another way to deal with this. And you do this one year in advance of your, of your meadows. And basically any of this, you start thinking about now for next year. So you can start implementing this planning because sheet mulching or solarization should really be starting now for next year because it has to have time to work. And if you're interested in that, definitely reach out. So then what we have here is um, site site selection and invasive plants you know it's it's important to figure out what do i do okay i pick the site there's there's all sorts of invasive plants so how do you control it first of all you want to identify that those plants and CKIS can certainly help you out with that we can help you out with that and then figure out an appropriate way to deal with them um, maybe it's just complete removal and there's different ways to remove different invasives or you're deadheading them because it's just too large a space you just don't want them to spread for now until you come up with a better plan. Soil health is really important um, as is replanting with non-invasives to avoid bare and disturbed soil. This is very different than having space for bees to nest. That's a controlled area where you're purposely keeping it bare, okay? Uncontrolled areas that are bare are just gonna fill with invasive seeds. So disposal, you can see here in the picture, you can actually put them in plastic bags and take them to our regional landfills here. They will, as long as they can see in the bag, put them in a complete area and a specific area and it's free. Do you don't want to compost? Um, unless you're doing thermophilic composting and if you don't know what that is, don't compost, okay? Um, and then don't dump, it's plant pollution and it carries heavy fines. So let's just take a quick minute, talk about meadows. 
So bee forage meadows in, in general site selection, you ideally want a sunny, warm spot. Um, this is where that sheet mulching comes in or potential um, tilling with cover crops. Uh, and then you've got the seed bed should be nice and smooth and, and, and nicely packed once you get those seeds in. Uh, you can use seeds or starts to find for meadows and things. It's better to use uh, seeds because starts get really expensive for large places. Uh, you want floral diversity, diversity of bloom times, and you can mix hardy annuals and perennials. Um, again, you just want to make sure that they are things that you can, that um, will come up at different times. And then planting times is usually fall plantings with spring, what I call touch up. So you can fill in the holes in the spring unless it's plants that need to be seeded in the fall and then you would seed them in the fall the next year. And these don't just run amok. You literally do have to manage them at first, require water control uh, of weeds and patience. So one specific variety is native plant meadows. You want to use local, e local ecotype seeds. You can source these. Um, we're working on the plant seed library and Kinseed and the Cooney Native Species Society is working on this. Don't plant in a wild uncontrolled meadow or in the wild on the side of a roadside or that non-native seeds because it is very difficult and hard on the ecosystem to manage that competition. Um, there's a really great leaflet from uh, the Kootenai Native Species Society on meadows. We can help you out with that as well. Uh, and wildlife pressure, work with the deer. This is a non-controlled meadow. We actually use the deer here. This is very early spring, so this is an example of how beautiful the meadow looks, but rather the deer are actually working to weed control here because they're eating the lamb's quarters out. And deer will just graze through. So expect that, don't stress about it, okay? And um, plants don't like over management and also don't go out and dig out plants. They will likely die uh, nine times out of 10 and it's again, you're disturbing the ecosystem they're in. Option two, which are controlled cultivated meadows. These are ones where you're controlling the seeds, you're controlling the meadow, you're not letting it get out into the wild. One of the things I would really stay, say here is make sure you're not planting invasive species. And we'll talk more about knowing your species and be cautious with seed mixes. You wanna make sure that those seed mixes don't convey, con contain invasive species from, your, from the area you're in. Um, and you wanna make sure that any seed packs that you purchase that are mixes contain a list, an ingredient list, so you know exactly what you're getting in there. Um, so all of those things are very important. So plant selection, okay, generally speaking, um, the government has a really uh, lengthy list. It contains 33 recommended plants. It's not exhaustive, so never think these lists are exhaustive. Also watch for errors. Even this particular list has errors, so definitely whenever you're in doubt, contact us. We're working on our own list here at Elk Root. It's selecting plants for high nectar resources. Um, it's also going to contain non-native and native species selections based on site considerations. And it'll help you determine depending on where you're planting. Um, and we're also working on quote unquote on proving lists and figuring out, you know, what plants are best for you so that when you're looking at seed mixes and that you're just being really careful and double checking before you plant. So why is this important? Invasive plants, okay? Why should you care about this? So, you, so invasive species, um, there's lots of discussion about this, but the reality is that they are having a great impact on it globally on biodiversity. And it's important to be plant-wise. So this program Laurie was talking about in the poll is making sure that you know what you're planting. Okay, and so it's knowing what you're growing and selecting non-invasive cultivars, which are the ones you'll find in a garden center uh, and native plants, which you can also find in the garden center. But like I said, it's better to get the really close to home ecotypic seeds. So always talk to us about that. We'd already talked about wild seed mixes and, and the wild seed mixes and the, the issues with those. So those really should only go in your controlled cultivar meadows um, from the garden centers. And be aware through the plant fried and grow me instead uh, program, which your invasives and your priorities are. And then um, download the PlantLize app. So you're looking at plant selection in general here and creating your bee garden. So variety is the spice of right life and you wanna create a new nutritional buffet for your bees, literally just like you would never just eat apples. Um, and you want to have a nice critical mass so that your bees are, are uh, attracted to the various 
groups. They like to get sort of the best bang for their buck. So they'll go, they'll go where there's lots of little flowers and things that are on maybe one flower or where there's a larger mass. So, you know, a nice packing of flowers. We have tons of flowers here, as you can see from these numbers that we've tried at Elk Root. So we can certainly help you out with that. When you are looking at plant characteristics, let's talk about favorites of bees. This Rudbecki is a beautiful one. And all of these pictures are showing you examples of flowers we have in our gardens that we find are very, very good for the bees. So they like lovely landing pads. So this is a great picture of a lovely landing pad. They also like, um, they're short-tongued and long-tongued bees, if you didn't know that. And they, they the flowers they choose, um, so you want a mix of those flowers that are, you know, some of them that are more tubular, some that are, that may have a huge nectar source, but that your short tongue bees can't get into those. So give them some options like this, um, you know, different flowers that they can get into like uh, lavenders, etc. cetera. Uh, they also have a color preference. They don't see red as a color, they see it as black. So red and black are black to a bee. They see more from the, the deeper yellows to uh, ultraviolet, so beyond our vision. So you wanna keep in sort of those hues of the rainbow. Uh, pitfalls, I will mention double blooms and pollenless varieties of plants. Um, you'll find sometimes sunflowers are pollenless, hybrids, be really careful at your garden centers. Uh, you'll notice I put all of the actual like Latin names on as well on these slides. So it shows you that that's the name you really want. And then the common names can sometimes be interspersed. So just make sure you're getting the right varieties. Double blooms are hard for bees to get into. So kind of avoid those too. Another thing with plant selection in general, this is a lovely picture of our perennial, one of our perennial gardens in process here. You'll see the holes there. Perennials come back year to year and can be moved around. They're really great and they're just a solid constant, sort of the base of your palette. And then annuals can be interspersed in between in the, in the little holes, which is why I use this picture. And you can change them year to year to change your color, but you always have a garden base. Veggie gardens. Let's talk about veggie gardens. Um, I get lots of questions about how to get pollinators in your veggie gardens. We always have a little three-pronged rule. We plant one for us, we plant uh, one for the rabbit, and one for the bees. Um, does that, is that a problem? Not really. We actually have rabbits everywhere here and babies in the orchard right now. Um, they really only go after little things. So if you've planted those, it's really great. Plant, plant a little extra of those and then you're good. So you can see here we've let these brassicas bolt and we let that happen every year. So ground covers and herbs, you probably already have some of these. Don't go pulling them out, just integrate them in what you're doing. They're super great for the bees here. And thyme is a great one, creeping thyme here. And actually thyme oil, which is derived from thyme, um, is used to help honeybees in uh, battling varroa mites, which is a real problem for us and has to be dealt with on a regular basis. And it is an ingredient that they're doing more research on. So if the bees are ingesting that, bringing it into the hive, it can be um, beneficial. So I'm gonna kind of whip through these quite quickly. I basically want you just to see these beautiful pictures. You can come back and you know get the names, write them out, but the reality is um, just enjoy, don't get caught up. And these are all things that are good for bees, okay? Dandelions, I know we're all kind of like, uh, dandelions, but Dandelions, considered a weed, but don't forget weeds are things that are growing where you don't want them. So in our really cultivated gardens where we're doing specific things, we weed out the dandelions. But our entire meadow in the spring is covered in dandelions. And the reason for that is it is one of the major bee source foods in the spring. And it's one of the earliest ones. So we let that go. If you're worried about them spreading before they go to seed, mow them and then they just blend into your lawn. It's not a big deal. Um, fireweed is another great one. It's a native plant here. Then don't forget if you're picking a space that you want to be careful to protect native host plants. So you don't want to dig up all the native host plants and put cultivars in because those native host plants are literally potentially for some bees the plant that they only go to for nesting materials, pollen, nectar, and there's this really important relationship. So be careful what you're digging up, okay? Um, who's interested in lawn alternatives and cover crops? That's a question I would like to know. Lori? Okay, so we just launched another poll there. So there's two questions. The first one is, do you have a grass lawn? Yes or no? And the next one, have you ever considered changing your grass lawn to bee turf? So we'll leave that open for 30 seconds here. So 15 more seconds. People are 
they know how to use polls now. They're answering fast right. and furious. Right. This is a super exciting topic and it's really interesting. And there's some really great products out there now that are super easy, like from West Coast Seeds. They actually have a product called Bee Turf. Um, we're going to be carrying some of West Coast Seeds uh, products here to make sure and, and can be bought. And those proceeds will go to, towards the bee, um, bee options. So we'll talk about this a little bit here and, uh, and get ourselves set. So looks like there's some definite interest in the whole bee turf concept. So you can see here from the pictures at Elkru, what we've done is we've actually created white Dutch clover to the left here. And we've created all our pathways out of this. And then you can see you can cut it really low and it actually likes to be cut. And the lower you cut it, um, the more flowers come. Now when you first seed, leave it long and then slowly cut it back so you don't kill the plant. But once it's established, it creates a beautiful mat. There's a lot of prep that goes into this beforehand. So again, if you want to do this, contact us specifically on this topic. Um, or, you know, look up the West Coast Seeds Guides. They're very helpful. Um, and you can see here, we did different heights. We've got the lawn and then we've got an area right beside our potentially future pond we're working on. And uh, it has uh, Phasalia and uh, White Dutch Clover taller and the bees just go wild for this. Uh, you can see here is an example of the cover the, the uh, pathways going in here. We always, when you're making pathways, do it in parts so you can let one part grow in and then you can walk on it and work on the next part. And then the white sweet clover is a great cover crop for those beekeepers that have large, larger spaces or if you're just trying to fix your soil and get it more healthy. So we used uh, that in this whole area to the right here before we put in the final beds, which you'll see later when you see the cosmos and sunflower pictures. So let's quickly build you a garden. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm going to give you a few plants really quickly that will literally fill in your whole garden. So to the left we have lavender. Okay, and this particular varieties are great. Okay, they're great borders. Okay, and then we have what I call um, discs. So big, those big fat landing pads. Um, they give you a different size and height, medium heights. Then we have what I call spikes, and they're the big tall ones that you want to have interspersed. And here you can see um, we have foxglove and, and then we have um, delphiniums. If you look in the really low left-hand corner of the delphinium picture, which is the purple, you'll see a little green hummingbird there. You will attract hummingbirds with these plants too, which is super cool. Uh, and this picture, one thing with the foxglove on the left you'll want to notice is that um, on the coast, if you're on the coast and watching this, it is under assessment because they have a much warmer climate, they tend to spread. So always cut these before they go to seed in your garden here. Here it's not as big a deal, but we still wanna manage them because we wanna keep these plants off the invasive species list and that comes down to you. Uh, and we have these everywhere, I'll be totally honest, and they're a beautiful plant, but we control them and manage them and that's what you need to be doing as well. Uh, and then if you want just a little bit of um, what I'll call texture, Phasalia, Phasalia, Phasalia. Okay, we have native varieties, which are amazing. And then this cultivated one, which we love, which we had incorporated by the pond picture there you saw earlier. These, if you do nothing else, are amazing, okay? And they're great as interspersed in your uh, veggie garden, which when I'm talking about curcurbits, for those of you who maybe don't know what that is, I'm talking about melons, cucumbers, all of those things that, that are, are squash. Uh, they're great because they just run, they produce great biomass and they're great for composting. Then if you want some really early bulbs, we've got crocus, uh, and that provides early flowers and the apples here if you're looking for a specific tree. Don't forget though about bear pressure, so you'll want to stay away from fruiting things unless you've got the ability to fence those off. Then we've got our season extenders. This kind of rounds out the palette. Uh, you've got evergreens here. We've got heathers and heaths. Heaths are your spring bloomers and heathers are your fall bloomers. Ericas are your springs, kalunas are your falls. Um, these little pink flowers here on this heath were blooming the minute they were already blooms formed under the snow so that when the snow left and the bees could fly, there was already flowers in the orchard, okay? And then asters there to the, to, um, on the other side, which are amazing fall bloomers and survive frost. Okay, I'm really gonna whip through these. You can look back through these. These are some of my faves and the ones that these love in the garden. Alliums, as you can see, there's multiple blooms on these. They go wild. These globe masters here are literally the size of a child's head, small child. And then you've got these beautiful hanging ones for a wilder look that are native, the nodding onion. Lupins, same thing. There is the cultivated variety. Now I know you see these Russell lupins, these colorful ones on the side of the highway. 
please don't do that. Um, they, they are not the actual native uh, lupin polyphyllis. They are a hybrid that's come. So don't put these on the side of the road uncontrolled if they're from the garden center. But if you have a garden, they're amazing. We have them in the garden. If you want something wild, use the silky lupine. We're trying to increase that here and it is native to the Kootenays. Then we got poppies. While they don't produce nectar, they come out at the perfect time for pollen. The bees go crazy um, and they bring back that pollen for, for their queens to be laying which is essential for laying. Geraniums, awesome, love Terra, same thing. This plant here, this Mont Blanc from West Coast Seeds literally goes crazy. And, and I'm not touting West Coast Seeds, we just have a, we actually approached them for sponsorship because they have such amazing non-GMO products. And did that plant there, I do nothing. I literally put a seed in a pot and away it goes and then I plant it in the ground and here you go. Uh, same thing here, agastache, licorice mint, and cat mint. These are not mentha, which is your, when you're thinking of edible mints, but licorice mint is actually an amazing, makes an amazing tea. Wouldn't eat the cat mint though. Klepsia, another great one. You've got um, speciosa here with the, sh with the monarch showy milkweed and it's amazing. It's a major nectar source. You see tuberosa a lot, which is the orange one here in the garden centers, but it's actually a minor nectar source. That's not to say not to plant it, but the major ones are kind of what you want to go for. If you have limited space, if you have a variety and actually can create a whole monarch way station, well, put all those milkweeds in, but don't forget they travel, so keep them contained um, or else you'll have them popping up everywhere. Don't confuse butterfly weed, which is you see is the common name of the tuberosa with the invasive species butterfly bush, okay? Be careful when you go to garden centers. Know your Latin and know your common. These two are amazing. The oringum are going off right now in our gardens and the bees are going crazy. They provide taller texture, gorgeous. These are lower, more compact, um, beautiful as well. If you can be careful when you're looking at seed mixes or buying Coreopsis tincturia, you can see in our tip here, um, because we have our own variety of native one in the Kootenays that has uh, been very well preserved and they will cross pollinate. And we would prefer to keep that nice and uh, native. So uh, if you see those in your seed mixes, definitely just be aware of that. And if you see them and you make a mistake and plant them, just cut them before they go to seed and their annuals, they won't come back, okay? Scabios and Veronica, again, you're back to these low sort of dinner plate flowers, uh, which are lower than the, um, the echinaceas and the rudbeckias, but offer some really pretty border. Uh, and then these beautiful spikes, this is another favorite. This is the picture I was talking about with the sunflower and the cosmos, beautiful. And this is the, what the garden started to shape up like after we took down that um, yellow uh, clover, okay, the sweet clover. These guys are great too, but be careful. They're, these guys do have invasive tendencies. They tend to travel and uh, you've got to just keep them under control. So try to go with native goldenrod, uh, especially for that reason, because they will escape. They just, they like to escape. <laughs> uh, designing and oversimplifying, you, we're going to do that, or sorry, designing and making it simple, because simple, it can be overwhelming. Um, lots of stuff. Let's keep it simple. Step one. Make a bloom timetable. This is an example. I use this one because it's just great for illustrative purposes. I find this is super, super helpful. Um, and this is a great place to start. So make that bloom timetable. We'll send you in the resource list uh, an Excel sheet. We basically put together a really basic one, um, but it will get you started and you can fill it in. You can create your own categories and subcategories. So for example, in the shrubs category here, you see in the picture, they've got all sorts of shrubs, but maybe you want to separate them by what's evergreen and non-evergreen. So for example, those early heaths I mentioned that are all green. There's very little green in the garden in the spring. So you might want to have a whole heath garden. They come in all these beautiful colors and the flowers and the foliage, gorgeous. Um, and then you wanna like, once you've got sort of like your table together, pick your favorite, favorite site suitable blooms. Um, some of those border plants, some of those discs, the tall spikes, early bulbs, season extenders, evergreen, and guess what? You've got a garden. Um, and then the reason this is so great is if you look back at this bloom timetable, you can fill in the blanks. So you've listed everything, you've figured out what you want, uh, and then you look and you go, wow, July, there's very few colored bars in July. I need to add some more flowers that are later flowers. Maybe I want to take out some of these May ones because uh, for room for those and same with August or even September. So that's really important to keep blooms all the way through through your bees. 
I like to call uh, the next step of designing, so you, you've made your bloom timetable, what I call uh, the paper doll method here at Elkrate. And I'm literally gonna just show you something here. I know this isn't very fancy pants and it's not like this pretty bulb table I put on the screen, but this is literally one of our uh, gardens at Elkrate. And what it did is I literally go from shortest to tallest, and then I go from earliest bloomers to late bloomers. So I actually like cut up garden magazines and those lovely catalogs. And then I can actually see where I want to source it from, um, when it's going to bloom, what it's going to look like. And I have this beautiful visual of what my garden will actually look like at the end of the day. So paper dolls, way to go for sure. Um, measure your bed. Put your paper dolls together, measure your bed, measure, measure, measure. I know that sounds crazy, but actually get out a tape measure. Don't just kind of try to pop them in because nine times out of 10, you'll be wrong and then you'll have everything bunched up and until you get a real feel for it. Choose your color palette, okay? You can see here, you, you, by doing that, you can pick a beautiful color palette. Here we got pinks and purples and oranges, which are beautiful colors together. And we end up with, you know, this beautiful color palette, or maybe you wanna do a monochromatic, totally up to you. And then that helps you to, plants and flowers these days come in so many colors that you can really find all sorts of really great ones. Um, then you're choosing your locations. You wanna know your, your height, your spread, bloom time, so that you create this whole gorgeous garden. And then you want to flag it okay so you literally i'll show you the next picture here this is our design mapping example so this is one of the gardens at elkwood this is literally us last spring crazy i know um it's hard to believe now when we look at the gardens but you can see all those little colored spots in there we've literally measured mapped flagged the different plants um we had picked our bed sizes and shapes we then picked which best plants went to which beds based on sun exposure and water and all of those sorts of things soil quality um keep in mind that Plant spread is not the same thing as spacing when you're looking at a seed pack. So, so it's packed. So spread is actually how wide the plant's gonna get. Spacing is how, what, how much space you want between your plants. So you might have a spread of 18 inches, but then you want to reserve a little space if you want, or if someone that wants a really manicured garden, or you might want it really bunched together if you're someone who wants a, a more spaced garden. So plant sourcing and seeds, um, you know, we already talked about a bunch of do's and don'ts. Definitely talk to us if you have any questions. Seeds versus starts, big areas, seeds are much more economical uh, and uh, starts are more expensive. So you kind of have to decide what makes sense for you. Uh, again, back to this native plant idea and local ecotype seed sources. Here's basically where I'd love to see you go for those. Uh, wholesale and large projects, we can certainly help you with that at Elk Root because we do a lot of sourcing here. And as I mentioned, we will be carrying some different seeds as well that will go then any uh, profit on those seeds will go towards conservation projects. Uh, we also will be doing our first annual fall fundraising sale here at Elk Root. Um, it'll be very small. So if you're interested in that, get on our email list and ask early if there's something specific you're looking for. Uh, and then as that goes on and we create the seed library with the native plants and have plants here, we will have a lot more. We'll also be doing multi-graphs on fruit trees and various heirloom trees uh, down the line here. So um, little little uh inspiration here we have this was literally us last spring after years you know two three years of planning prepping doing all the sheet mulching doing all the cover cropping because we had major invasives we had major thistle problems and that's why we actually picked this area so back to that site selection and you can see this was mid july last year so that would have been april and this was mid-July. So it's amazing the transformations you can make. Here's another great example. We have um, a mix of what I, you know, you look at there's a kale plant there. You've got the cabbages growing, which will then bolt later in the season. But then we've got all these beautiful flowers going, which really makes for a gorgeous display. So you, you think outside the box. You don't have to do all of these uh, really... Let your imagination run wild and just sit down and after this and ponder what you really want and what your space is. And like I said, ponder now for next year so that you can start figuring out what you have to prep. Do you have to get solarization going or sheet mulching and which means talking to us? Uh, <laughs> or of course, you know, you're welcome to check out resources online and get it all sorted and then contact us and say, hey, it's sort of like Dr. Google, right? There's a lot out there. So you can always do all that research and then contact us and see if you're on track, okay? And this is um, 
the different stages where you can see we've got the clover path in, we've started building out the gardens here and these gardens are filling more in, more and more. And this is back to the spacing issue where you can see we actually spaced everything quite far apart the first year because we want to make sure there's room for them to grow because um, they will spread. Okay, super important. Now, I know that was a lot, uh, but we wanted to cover all those topics so you know that you have resources to come back to and we'll send you that resource list. Um, one of the biggest resources we're so pleased and hoping we will have starting next year and for this year for all of you special vips on this particular presentation you're welcome to contact us via email you're welcome to come out and volunteer this year as the gardens are in progress to learn uh and then at the end of the day you can um pick the the brains at elk Root for uh some help for specific things that's uh, and and we do consulting by donation uh next year we'll be setting up internships and more structured volunteering we'll be doing some demonstrations of some of these things like the solarization like the mulching some of these more technical things you're looking for um and all of that goes towards funding these gardens funding and supporting the programs and what we're doing um, and sharing that all with you because that is all something that we are putting together and also the conservation projects for that whole inhabitants uh, wild inhabitants and conservation in and around it going hand in hand with these agricultural practices and bee protection um, and also for those of you that are beekeepers because there seemed like there was uh, quite a few of you there or schools, if you are wanting to look for funding to plant bees, uh, bee forage, uh, if you are a commercial farmer, you can get involved with the environmental farm plan. And once you get through that process, there is some funding available that you can uh, apply for, for bee forage specifically. Uh, if you're a beekeeper, the BBC program that I mentioned, we have a wonderful relationship with now and so appreciate them. Um, Coming February again, they'll be doing their next round of cycles and it's now is the time to be planning what you want to do, what you want to apply for so that you are shovel ready because that's what they expect. They don't want you to apply in February and then have to wait a whole year. It's done on an annual cycle. So you have to be prepared. So now is the time to do it and all those resources will be available for you to check out. So a big thank you to our sponsors, CKIS, um, British Columbia government uh, actually sponsors both of us and us particularly through the Investment in Agriculture Foundation with the bee innovation projects, particularly doing, uh, we're doing some really cool projects with creating overwintering solutions like our bee barn, which is a presentation unto itself. Uh, the bees are just doing amazing. Uh, and we, we do all sorts of great things with that. Also, we are completely self-sustaining apiary models we don't bring in any outside bees, which is great for avoiding disease spread. Um, another thing we are hoping to share. So very, very uh, cool stuff. And as you can see, we have some great sponsors. West Coast Seeds is one of our sponsors um, because we approach them. And I want to make that clear. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not one to uh, talk talk wonderful about people unless it's uh, deserved as far as sponsorship goes. So definitely check them out. And a big thank you to Pacific Northwest Garden Supply who. Uh, uh, just kindly donated a bunch of materials to get us started. Uh, so thank you to all those people and Columbia Basin Trust, which is so supportive of um, the Columbia Basin, which is a sponsor of CKIS. So check your inbox. Okay. One flower I didn't mention, which I kind of really love, but are not bee flowers. Okay. Because it's, they're fuzzy. The bees have trouble getting into them. But once they get past um, that stage, and uh, are really open. The bees can get in there a little bit, but actually what I love having one or two of these in the garden for if you have a big garden, if you don't have a big garden, then you don't know, no, you know what, they're not the best bee plant, but you gotta plant something for yourself too, right? Uh, but our bumblebees in the summer literally sleep in these flowers, sleep, quote unquote. So they, once they get too cold to fly, they tuck in here and all of this, and then they're just in the morning, I will be looking through and they'll just be hanging out, stretching. And so it's kind of a nice place for them to hang out. So I, I, I feel um, while they're not getting the nutritional needs, they are getting some of that, you know, support for environment. Here's uh, how to get a hold of us. Feel free to reach out and any questions. I think uh, I think that wraps it up, Lori, and and we're ready to see what everyone's minds. So hopefully they're not too blown up.
<laughs> no, you are bang on time. So we have about 10 minutes for questions here. And we did have some people um, type in the chat box. So just a reminder, if you did have a question, uh, to type it in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to all of them. So let's kick things off here with a question from Alita. She asked, how far do apparees, and I apologize if I butcher that <laughs> pronunciation, need to be from each other to control the honey flavor they produce? I have 40 acres would like to be able to offer two or three different honeys and wonder if that is realistic. And she's giving the example of elderflower, orange blossom, mixed general honey. So if you can address that question, that'd be great. Sure, absolutely. So um, that was a great try, by the way, Lori. It's apiary. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start with that just so that we're all on the same page. So yeah, doing specific honeys are an interesting one, right? Um, it's challenging and, and as a purchaser actually be aware that when you're buying those honey sometimes it's just flavor that's added so make sure you're getting a nice local honey and you know what's in there but from addressing the question um first of all if you have two flowers that have very different sort of bloom times and don't overlap that is possible right so for example you'll see blueberry honey and and people do blueberry honey because all they're growing is blueberries Okay, and and then they take those honey, those honey frames out of the hive, and they they know that that's primarily blueberry. You'll also have to check the exact regulations, which I don't know off the top of my head of of what percentages you actually need to be able to call something blueberry honey bat. But that's a perfect example where you'll see those those um, pollinator uh, businesses that they're selling blueberry honey because they know for sure that's all that's in there. Um, if you have a, uh, you said you had 48 acres, so that's a pretty large zone. What you have to keep in mind is your bees will fly up to a five kilometer radius looking for forage, right? So if you have a beehive within that and you've got a five kilometer weight radius and all you've got blooming is that particular thing, then yes, you can absolutely do it. It becomes to the latter part of your question unrealistic in, for example, our environment where we have all of these flowers. We're trying to create optimal bee health uh, with a huge variety and for us then, ours is mixed, ours is mixed wildflower honey and, and there's, or sorry, mixed flower honey um, and, and we call it orchard honey because so many of the plants and the trees. Now in the spring, for example, uh, we could produce orchard honey because basically what's all that's blooming are the fruit trees, okay? And then the next, and that's the bloom time part of it. And then in the fall, if nothing else is blooming and you're doing goldenrod honey, right? If you wanna do that, you could do uh, one in the early and one in the late. But keep in mind, it's really nice to have that variety. So really think about what your goals are. Is, is it um, doing those types of specific things and then shifting your bees around a bit so they get optimal health or just how you're managing those things? So it is possible, just take some planning. Okay, great. So we have the next question here from Anne. She's asking, any favorite bee forage plants that are deer resistant? Ah. Her favorite word. <laughs> I guess I, I didn't touch on this as much as I, I have at other times. So deer resistance is an interesting one, right? Uh, if you are working on, uh, and that was when I was talking about the, um, the lamb's quarters, for example. So one of the things I actually suggest is planting something they like so they leave the thing that you want to grow. That's one little tip. But don't forget, if a, if a deer or an animal is hungry enough, I mean, I have what are some things that are considered deer resistant, like irises, um, irises, uh, alliums, some of those bulbs, daffodils in the spring, uh, that the deer, you know, there's not a lot around at that point, and they'll still test it, you know, they'll go, oh, look at that, and they'll chomp it, and then go, Puh, and spit it out on the ground and there are times where I will see a bloom literally covered in deer saliva where they've just gone, oh, I don't want to eat that, but they've still essentially kind of wrecked your, your flower garden. So you have to just sort of work with them that way. Uh, specific ones are the ones that I just mentioned, those, those daffodils, um, irises, um, they tend to stay away from poppies, but also phizalia, which I mentioned, which is a great one. Uh, we have it out in our controlled cultivated meadow. The deer were out there last night. We had two little bucks and another deer. Uh, they were in there going crazy eating stuff, they didn't touch the Vizalia, and the reason is it's spiky. 
okay? And when you're handling it, you don't want to really touch it without gloves either. So, you know, there's lots of other things. So it's back to that first point I made, which kind of wraps this up. They left that alone because there was other things to eat. It's spiky. They don't even bother to try to bite it off. So there's back to that whole Pizzella being the number one bee diversity plant. And deer resistant, <laughs> which I kind of laugh because I've watched it here. And yeah, I always just say good luck, but those are some good picks. So Sarah's wondering which lupin uh, for coastal. So is Russell okay for the coast or still prefer silky? So silky's um, the, is us basically. Um, I believe big leaf lupine is the coast. I'm more specific to this area. So uh, if you wouldn't mind just sending me that question so I can double check that. I never like to give out the wrong information and I'm very specific to our plants. We have big leaf lupine in the, uh, the native plant nursery more as a comparator, uh, but I would have to double check the specific, and, and also the coast is a broad region, right? So are you talking, uh, uh, you know, the southwest coast, or are you talking mid or, or deeper, or are you talking the island? That all changes, and the island is a very specific ecosystem. So send me that question with a specific region, if you could, of the coast, and then I can address it. So Sarah, if you, maybe you can just private message me your email. Um, we can get back to you um, with a more defined answer to your question. I always would rather just say, I don't know, I got to check and let's clarify that than give you something that's not quite right. Um, so another, it looks like we do have some folks from the coast joining us. So someone's asking if there's a recommended sister organization like yours in Van or the North Shore that you're, you can direct people to. So um, again, if we're referring, referring to CKIS, um, Laura, you can probably speak to this. I know about the Sea to Sky uh, Invasive Species Coalition. Um, as far as elk root, I don't know of anyone. Um, we are, I think, filling a void, which is, is where we came up with this concept. Um, I, you know, we are familiar with the coast, though. Uh, we, we do have, um, we did live on the coast for a long time and we do have experience with coastal gardening, coastal beekeeping, so that we certainly can help you from afar. Um, we also are in and out of Vancouver a lot. So if you're looking at wanting that consultation by donation uh, model uh, and have it us when we're in and around that area, it's certainly something that's possible. But right now I don't know of anyone that's doing what we're doing. But that's not to say there isn't, I just, I'm not familiar. Uh, we have some questions around, a couple of people are asking about volunteer opportunities um, with yeah. someone, you know, they want to change their lawn to a bee pollinator garden, but want to yeah, come and you Absolutely. So can you maybe just expand on what the volunteering opportunities are? And I think maybe we sure. could probably add this in the email out to get yeah. how people can get on your, yeah. your volunteer uh, registry. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, we are... We had, um, we actually just started the volunteer uh, program in a very ad hoc way. And it was basically people that had already contacted us and said, hey, can we do this? So um, we had our first person out on Sunday and she, uh, exactly, she was just like, oh my God, I have so many questions. This is amazing. And so she's now coming out once a week uh, to learn. But yes, so, so what we're doing is we're practicing social distancing. So that makes it a little bit more challenging this year um, so we're not doubling up on people um, not so much because we have so much space but washroom facilities things like that so we're just being really careful uh, but that said you can contact us we can figure out if there's a some dates and times that work for you uh, and then you can come out right now and see things what I do is give we give a little orientation tour if there's something specific you want to work on for example she really wanted to work on um, learning how to to um, clip and take care of flowers once they were already established so I gave her you know uh, an introduction to that and how to do that but there's also a lot of basic work that needs to be done like um, you know, weeding, maintaining, but I also give you like the paper dolls of the gardens. You learn about the gardens, the different flowers, and then you can walk around and see, and we can also talk about lawn stuff. We would like to do, uh, as I said, next spring we would be, and into the winter, get on our email list. That's the best thing. And you'll see when we're going to talk about 
like I said, the whole prep and preparation for changing out your lawn, where to get the resources. We'll probably even be able to have the seeds available through West Coast Seeds here for next spring. So if you want to start getting that process going, yeah, come out, volunteer. You can pick our brain at the end of the day for, you know, half an hour and chit chat and get to know it. And the more you're out here for a little bit, then we can apply that to something you're doing uh, next spring. So we are at 11 o'clock, Kate. Um, there is one more question and a couple comments. Are, do you okay. have time for like five more minutes to address? Sure. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, great. So we have a question asking the best way to remove sod effectively. Uh. <laughs> the best way to so the interesting thing about sod is um you know it's pretty shallow generally this also depends though and this is again back to the whole thing of kind of that individual consultation issue which is always something i i find so are you to, or are we dealing with cooch grass which is a really difficult thing or are we talking about a, an urban city lawn where you're literally just going to take sod knives slice it back, peel it back, use the machinery that's great for that, going online, renting, you know, sod removal equipment and getting rid of uh, a, a city lawn. Or are we talking about needing to um, figure out how to deal with cooch grass, which may actually involve a much more in-depth process, may take actually a couple of years before you even plant a, a full, you're going to have to do prep and solarization and mulching. So um, long story short, it depends again on what you're you're looking for. So so that is a question that again send Laura your your email and we can get back to you on that as a general thing. But again, it depends on our, that initial preparation question I asked, which is, do you have an existing garden? Are you starting from scratch? Um, what's in there already? What's not in there? Are we talking cooch grass? Or are we talking just a really pretty lawn that um, is pretty but not good for the bees, right? Okay, so two final just comments here that um, a participant put in and maybe you can just expand or highlight if, if this, they're on the right track here. So okay. um, we have a comment here saying an etym ento <laughs> oh, geez. an entomologist says 50% native platoon in our garden from the native bees and to plant groups one meter so they don't have to fly and use up all their energy. So I'm not 100% sure what that's getting at. Is that making sense to you, Kate? Can you just read it one more time? I missed the first little bit. Yeah, there, she's saying that 50% native platoons in our garden from the native bees, and they have to plant groups of one meter so they don't have to fly far and use up their energy. Okay, so as a comment, that's a great comment. Um, the reality is some native bees are teeny tiny, like teeny, teeny, tiny, you know, you often, what you think of, or and we think of native bees are awesome, the big bombas, like the big bumblebees you see, and you're like, oh, look at the bumblebees, but there are teeny, tiny bees, and that whole energy factor that we're talking about, and that's where having that variety, and that little bit of everything in your garden is really great, because those teeny, tiny native bees, that's exactly correct, they do not fly very far, I mean, you think about it, if they were to go up to any height, they just get blown off track, and end up, you know, way gone from where their home is and not be able to get back. So they tend to stick close to the ground, stick close to home, and the closer their food source is to their nesting, which is why I was saying leave some space for nesting, uh, the better chance they're gonna have a viability and to be healthy. Okay, great. Um, then just another um, tip or comment that was put in there. Someone said, I let the wild plants bloom and then take them out after the bloom when they go into seeds. The native bees have foraging food. So is that a good tip to, that people should be doing or can you highlight? Expand? Yeah, can you say it one more time? Yeah, for sure. Um, she said, I let the wild plants bloom and then take them out after the bloom when they go into seed. So the native bees have foraging food. Okay, I'm not quite sure what that's getting at. Um, what I would say though is it it's a great thing. So what I will equate that to and if I'm wrong from the person who said it they can uh, again contact us and and clarify something but the concept of in your garden if you've got a garden going and you get volunteers for example and I think this is what they're getting at I call them volunteers because they're not weeds so for example we had a tomato plant come up in a bed that um, wasn't supposed to necessarily be there but we're letting it grow because it volunteered. It's a really healthy plant. It's great. Same with um, little wildflowers and things that come up. They may be in a spot, but 
they work or they're not causing any issue. And yeah, you, you can totally let them volunteer and hang out. That's how I let sunflowers pop up in our garden. We have these beautiful sunflowers and in the fall, um, they go to seed. They're in our controlled garden again. So I want to clarify that if you're ever letting things go to seed and they are not the native ecotype that you've never touched and they're just doing their thing. Um, you want to control your seeds, but we have sunflowers pop out up throughout the orchard and then I pick and choose where I want them to be, you know, and, and then I pull the ones that, that are going to interfere with something, but it's not going to interfere with stuff. I have sunflowers all over the place and that's a beautiful thing. So absolutely a great thing, but just remembering that if they're not a native plant, and I believe the person is identifying that, that they're leaving alone the native plants, which is fantastic. Um, just controlling the cultivars. If you're going to do that with seeding, it needs to be in your controlled garden. But yeah, great thing to do. It's like that veggie bolting thing, right? So the last question is actually for me, it's about the PlantWise program. So someone yeah. was just wondering about the app. Um, so again, we'll send this in the email, but what it is, the PlantWise app, you can get it for Android device, devices, um, for Apple devices. And what it is, it just basically highlights the top 26 invasive species that we're still seeing for sale in greenhouses and the recommended um, alternatives that are either native or, or non-invasive. So something at your fingertips right there, and we're going to send you other, other resources through PlantWise. But yeah, it is called the PlantWise app. So if you're on um, the app store, that's what you want to be looking for, and it's free to download. And that will be sent through the email at the end. So that wraps it up. So I just want to thank everyone for participating and showing interest on this. Uh, it's a pretty, I live in Roslyn. It's a pretty nice day here. So thanks for taking the time out of your day to come in and chat with us. And I also want to thank Kate from Elk Root Conservation Farm for sharing your expertise. You definitely have inspired me to uh, get some more flowers for the bees and hummingbirds um, out there. So thank you so much. And just a reminder to all to uh, check your inbox. We just kind of dipped our toes in the water on this topic. There's lots to learn. So we're going to send you information to, to get you on your way, including that um, information around the funding piece. So um, Kate, I don't know if you wanted to wrap up or, or end with any yeah. closing comments, but I think bottom line is have fun. And, and, you know, it, the whole idea is to show you, you can make something absolutely gorgeous that benefits the bees and your own aesthetic and uh, give you a place to start basically and, and enjoy it, you know, don't get overwhelmed with it. And the beauty is with plants, it's like a living, um, a living tapestry or a living art project. Uh, if something doesn't work, you can always shift it around, move it around, that's part of the process too. So just enjoy it and, and just enjoy the process. A lot of gardens, it takes, you know, one, two, three, four, I always find a garden looks kind of its best at year three because you've planted the first year and so there's lots of holes and then the second year things start filling in and you go, hmm, didn't really think that's what it was going to look like. So you move that out and by year three, you've got things really kind of looking where the way you want them to and, and you can see also what, which plants the bees like and don't like in your particular spot and what grows well in your particular spot or doesn't and sub in and sub out. So uh, just enjoy it and uh, if you have questions, definitely reach out. Awesome, Kate. Have fun and help the bees. Sounds like a, a great way to be. That's awesome. Okay, guys, that's us for now. Thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned. We'll be offering some webinars in the future as well. And remember to fill out our survey and check your inbox. We're going to sign off. Thank you so much.